our Marines who had survived more than three and one half years of brutal combat, the big day finally came. It was 30 August 1945 when veterans of the famed 4th Marine Regiment went ashore at Tokyo Bay. This was their last amphibious operation of World War II. Now they stepped out of their landing craft onto the prostrate form of the enemy himself. At Tokyo, the silent, beaten heart of Japan, Marines found a desert of stone. Tokyo, like all Japanese cities, was a carpet of rubble from which occasional derelicts poked their way toward the sky. The destruction by air had been so expertly planned, so systematic, as to be awe-inspiring even to the victors who witnessed it. Cities, harbors, and public utilities had been destroyed. Industries had been smashed. Transportation had been paralyzed. Civilization itself had been erased in the Japanese home islands, reducing the people to a dazed, broken condition. No Japanese now could believe in the invincibility of his race. Nor could any Japanese hear the sound of airplane engines without knowing abject fear. To the enemy homeland, the airplanes spelled doom. Accurate, low-flying carrier planes. The heavy bomber. But most of all, the super bomber. The B-29. The B-29, in all its implications, was a tremendous undertaking. The design of these mammoth planes was a testimony to American ingenuity. The quality of the B-29 and the quantity in which it was manufactured remains a tribute to the American working man and woman. These sky giants needed gas, thousands of gallons of it. They needed bombs, thousands of tons of them. They needed ammunition to protect them, information to direct them. But even more important to the success of the B-29 were the bases from which they could operate effectively against Japan. In order to secure these bases, the importance of which was well recognized by the Japanese, an uninterrupted series of difficult amphibious assault operations was necessary. And the amphibious operation is the most difficult, the most complex, the most specialized type of operation in the military repertoire. In the Pacific War, space was an ally of the Japanese. And space was an inflexible limitation of the B-29 whose effective operating radius was approximately 1,500 miles. These range fans illustrate the targets available to our B-29s had they been based on the west coast of the United States. Nor could B-29s reach the enemy from bases remaining to us after the bitter opening months of the Pacific War. Thus were the wings of this powerful giant bird clipped by space. Neither money nor science were able, in the time available, to bring the B-29 within effective range of Japan. The task of providing the necessary springboards within striking distance of the enemy fell to the lot of another type of specialist, trained specialists in the complex amphibious techniques. The entire B-29 effort waited not for the success or failure of a new bomb site or motor fuel. It waited for the success of shock troops, of men painstakingly trained in the art of landing on hostile beaches and securing them. 
the B-29 effort waited for the United States Marines, whose task it was to storm the beaches of the broad Pacific. Tracking through the tough outer shell of the Japanese island defenses was a bitter job. It took time, coupled with the best in amphibious know-how. the outer shell fractured, and with the Pacific War beyond the halfway mark, Japan remained out of bombing radius of the B-29. The next step in the long amphibious march was the Marianas. Here were potential nests for the Eagle. From bases at Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, now bristling with enemy defenses, the B-29 might one day paralyze the Japanese homeland. Out of a successful amphibious assault on the Marianas, the great B-29 effort would be born. To the United States Marines, standard bearers in the amphibious march across the Pacific from the day of our first ground offensive, went the task of seizing these islands, the key to the success of the B-29. Again, the Marines landed. Again, they demonstrated the power generated by 165 years of familiarity with the amphibious problem. Desperately defended Saipan fell, then Tinian, then Guam. Behind the Leathernecks came bulldozers to level the landscape and make bases for our super bombers. Scarcely had the Marines secured Saipan, Tinian, and Guam when these islands became interlaced with ribbons of concrete. And to the north, the enemy learned that the Marines had landed in the Marianas and awaited the sound of airplane engines that spelled the end to his imperialistic plan. The United States Marines spearheaded the greatest amphibious offensive in the history of warfare. And from that offensive came the B-29 to visit terror and destruction on the enemy until he was crushed. But the impetus and knowledge that made the incredible amphibious march across the Pacific possible did not begin at the Marianas. Nor did it begin with World War II. Far from it. Marines have been our amphibious experts since the birth of the nation. Since Captain Samuel Nicholas took his 270 Leathernecks ashore in 1776, Marines have unceasingly developed their specialty. And as that specialty grew, so grew tradition. The United States Marine Corps has never failed to accomplish its assigned mission. It was in the period between two world wars that the Marine Corps reduced the amphibious operation to a science and research was accelerated. Despite their lack of numbers and resources, Marines strove to develop modern amphibious equipment and techniques. These old ships, boats, and the oddly equipped men who bring them through the surf seem like fragments of ancient history. And yet, from these beginnings grew landing craft that mastered the beaches of the Pacific. And from these pioneers in khaki grew the amphibious techniques which earned the United States Marine Corps the reputation of the finest assault landing force in the history of warfare. The years of research and experience brought results. One by one, the perplexing land, sea, and air problems of the ship-to-shore operation were met and defeated. 
Landing craft developed in a multitude of directions. With the help of the Navy, methods were developed for bringing artillery and heavy equipment ashore. But equipment was only one of the multitude of problems involved. Marines realized long before the war that combat loading of ships was a science that had to be mastered. They hammered away at the problems and developed a technique which even today stands unsurpassed. The shore party. Beach logistics. No technique, no matter how slight, could be overlooked without weakening the total effort for perfection. And the Marines, in two decades of conscientious effort, developed and mastered every one. To provide close support for landing waves and for troops ashore, trained pilots and effective aircraft were essential. Marine aviation, famed for its pioneering in the field of close air support, was a powerful factor in the dynamic evolution of the air, sea, ground, amphibious force. At Quantico's desks and classrooms, technical problems were pursued and new methods were formulated. Then the problems were taken to the beaches where direct observation and practice could provide the final test. Realistic exercises were staged off the Carolina coast and the Chesapeake Shoals. sponsorship, the amphibian tractor became a reality. Without this tractor, the assault of coral-fringed islands would have been impossible. Then, when war came, it found the United States Marine Corps ready. The specialized knowledge and incomparable tradition that had accrued over 165 years of battle and research paid off. Space, time, reefs, Tide, jungles, atolls, defenses, obstacles. All these were factors on which the Japanese counted heavily. But all these were factors that had been defeated by the Marines, on paper and in realistic maneuvers, before the Pacific War began. Because they were experts at their specialty, when the Marines launched their amphibious offensive, nothing could stop it. The Solomons, Guadalcanal, the turning point of the war. Then the central Solomons with their steaming beaches and jungles. Bougainville came next, a strategic equatorial landmass on the road to Japan. Cape Gloucester, Emerald. After a year and a half of expert planning and flawless execution of amphibious techniques, Marines were hacking their way out of the jungles toward the setting sun. The atolls. The enemy boasted that Tarawa was a beach that could not fall, but the enemy did not reckon with leatherneck courage and know-how. At Tarawa, as at Nassau in 1776, the Marines landed and were successful. Roy, Namur, Eniwetok, Peleliu. Utilizing their traditional skill and knowledge from ship to shore, Marines had driven a wedge deep into the Central Pacific. Then came the strategic Marianas, key to the B-29 effort. Marines carved beachheads on Saipan.
Argentinian. suicidal enemy resistance. Here in the Marianas, the United States Marine Corps again demonstrated that tradition and training had caused it to become the most powerful amphibious striking force in the history of warfare. Leathernecks took Iwo Jima. This volcanic island that broke the surface of the North Pacific was perhaps the toughest amphibious target ever assigned to a landing force. This was a mission meant for specialists. had completed their specialist jobs on Iwo Jima, the island meant mercy to B-29s operating from bases on Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Then with the army, Okinawa in the strategic Ryukyu archipelago. This was an imperial Japanese province. Enemy home soil. took 85% of this island, including the two principal airfields that brought all of Japan and much of Manchuria under American bomb sites. The great air armada that obliterated the Japanese nation was the knockout blow that came after more than three and one half years of mortal struggle. It was not machines alone that defeated the enemy, it was men. Brave men with even more heart than heavy equipment. Brave men coupled with an amphibious idea born many years before and nourished without cease by the United States Marine Corps. These Marines, with their incomparable amphibious know-how, are indeed the unsung heroes of the bombing of Tokyo and of the setting of the Imperial Sun.